So varied and distinguished was his career. Cricketer, dynamic and debonair. Called to the degree of the Ottawa. He later became High Commissioner. Sportsman, politician and diplomat. On the race relations board he calls, how's that? Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry. And ever bold in body line. Back in Liverpool it is plain to see what a VIP is, Sir Larry. Coloured people are not strangers in Liverpool. Many have been here for generations. But the war brought a huge influx of immigrant workers to help the British war effort. Constantine's job was to introduce them to the strange world of a big English city and look after their welfare. The British Empire, as it was then, as distinct from the British Commonwealth as it is today, was something in which which held out a lot of promise and a lot of future to them. So that when they were defeating Hitler, they felt that they were making progress towards their independence, towards their uh, estimate of democracy. So it was as much their war as it was the Englishman's war. These shots are from a film of him widely shown at the time. The Ministry of Information was quick to realize that there was great propaganda value in the fact that Constantine, the famous famous cricketer was deeply involved in a vital task, that of integrating the newcomers from the sun into British society. For this work he was later awarded the MBE. I had to do almost everything for them. Uh, they worked in the factory, I had to see they were comfortable in the factory. They wanted to send money home, I had to make arrangements to see that they sent their money home. I had to look into the hostels that housed them while they were here. I had to help them to find digs when they were working in Birkenhead and places like that. And in fact, we had one phrase which we used. The only thing they didn't ask us to do was to pull the chain for them. <laughs> War is in the air, all West Indians will do their share. That is why they came, and not seeking glory or fame, they will fight. Fight for victory, let us raise a cheer, they will fight. Fight and never fear, victory is near. March, march, march to victory. March, march, march to victory. Fight, land, sea and in the air, on to victory. When you see a sign like that, just what do you feel? Well, I have often wondered whether it wouldn't be a good thing for the whole world if some economist would get the figures that Britain earned out of the colonies since they took control of them, balance it against the expenditure in respect of those same colonies, take the contribution that colored people have made in the war, in the factories, on the battlefield, and see if it, there isn't a contribution, a great contribution that the colored people have made to make Britain a great country. When I see this, and I remember that the co contribution we made in Liverpool for beating Hitler, while you have the fascists today peddling their foul doctrine all over the country, whether we shouldn't make as brave an effort to get rid of them, dispose of them, as we dispose of Hitler. Hey, when I see a, a sign like that, um, I, I'm just angry. Uh, it's neither desirable nor wise that Britain should be kept entirely white. It would be a less interesting place to, to live in if it was entirely white. But I'm prepared to make a bargain with the English people if they're going to bring all the people who are of uh, this country's origin already in Africa, who have made it impossible for me to live in my country, then I'd be prepared to say, let's, um, let's all go home. I, I used to know all docks down here. We had a lot of boys working as welders, as tin plate men, and uh, they worked at Gladstone docks, they worked all along the waterfront. And sometimes there was a little trouble and I had to go. Then I would take the ferry or I would drive my car through the Mersey Tunnel and I would get across to Burton Head and investigate some problem there. We had a lot of fellows staying at the, at the YMCA. 
Yes. But on the whole, it was interesting work. You never had the same problem two days running. I think the most versatile people in the world are West Indians for making different kinds of trouble. But you have landmarks like the Liber building, and, and oh, it's still yes. there. I mean, oh, was it ever bombed during no, the war? No, no, it's never bombed. The, st the story goes that the Germans would never bomb the Liber buildings because it was their mark of recognition of the whole of Liverpool. They arranged themselves from the Liber building. But if, if that is true, it was purely pretty good precision bombing because they bombed everything around it yes. and they never hit the Liber building. It would have been unfortunate too because I used to fire watch in the life of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have been knocked off your pedestal. I have been knocked off your pedestal, but I used to be a good sleeper in those yes. days, Lewis. I used to hear the siren go and I never heard the all clear and all the bombing went on and I was sleeping as tight as ever. When he first encountered racial prejudice, the loaded dice of injustice, the root causes of which he was well aware, were insecurity, ignorance and fear. Neither biology or history support notions of innate supremacy. are just the same. This whole front is different from what it used to be. You have protection against the wind there, but you didn't have it in the old days. You just came down and ran down and ran down the passage and caught your boat. Mm. So, Larry, the very stones of this city are mixed with the blood of slaves. I understand that, uh, that slaves used to be bought by people from Liverpool in Africa for say, something like 20 pounds and then sold in America for something like 70 pounds which is, was a, a profit of about 50 pounds and, uh, and that the prosperity of this city uh, came out of the slave traffic. How did you feel this morning when you came in and you were met with such great honor at the station? Well, times have changed. When I came here before the war I used to be very unhappy. I used to think of the slave trade, I used to think they were transported from Africa here and my grandparents, as you know, came from Nigeria, transported from here to Bristol, from Bristol to the West Indies and it was a very unhappy association. But gradually the war was going on and everybody was fighting to defeat Hitler and I was one of them who felt that I was doing a good job. Then it came to an end and I went away and now I'm back. And I don't mind confessing, it's very pleasant to come back to Liverpool and see the old familiar places. We hear it said that uh, during the war, because of this common effort, that a, a spirit was engendered, which was on the whole uh, very beneficial for the uh, integration of the Negroes into the community. It was a tremendous spirit. Uh, all the people in England had a comradeship which you coming here now would never be able to appreciate. Everybody was one. Everybody was smiling in the face of a lot of adversity. I just wish we could recapture that spirit in England. So Larry, you are now an advisor to the Race Relations Board, which is trying to iron out the same problems in this country today. What would you advise a West Indian who wants to come to this country? I would certainly advise him to remember that he is coming to a country that, it, that is not truly his own. That he could come here, that he could learn, he can make progress and he can make greater material progress in this country than he can in his own. And that he must remember that he is in somebody else's country and that although 
he must not lose his own identity. He can't come here and live his life as he would live it in his country and only mixing with his group of people. I would object to that and I would say he's wasting his time. He might as well stay in his country. But there is a lot in this country that he cannot get in his own country. And he must get that advantage, take advantage of it, and as soon as the opportunity offers, go back to his country and make his contribution there. It's often said by people in this country that why can't West Indians and all the other foreigners uh, stay where they, they lived before? Why can't they find work there? What would you advise these people? This, this, this is a question that everybody puts to you. You come from a branch of the Commonwealth. You have everything in your background that's English or let's say that's British. The school you attend to, at least you attend, the curriculum is an English curriculum. The British control the economy of that country. So that when you come to Britain, you came in the old days, it's not a popular phrase, you came to the mother country. Why should anybody restrict you to your country when Britain controlled your country, when the Englishman went out to that country? I don't see any reason or logic in the question at all, and I believe it should never be answered. There ought to be easy movement between one branch of the Commonwealth and another, and no other answer will be acceptable to me. So, Larry, some people think that the emotions aroused by the differences of color are so deeply ingrained in people that the problem is almost insoluble. You, with your hindsight of history and race relations, are you hopeful about the future? Well, I am optimistic about the future. I'm bound to be. To be pessimistic about that is to envisage a war between black and white. That would be intolerable. I can see that so many colored people would object to so many things. I could see so many white people objecting to the advance of colored people, people they have called inferior for a long time. That has got to be ignored by both sides. And I can visualize that in the future, I think it, within my lifetime, the relationship will so change and will give such promise that when my time comes to leave, I will know that the little contribution I have made, added to others, will leave a world fit for my child and your child to live in. I'm certain that that is bound to come. From time to time during the war, and for three seasons afterwards, Constantine played for Windhill in the Bradford League. But the time had come for him to leave the cricket field. When feeling the ball, he was no slouch. He crouched, he didn't stand like Colin Bland, appealing in tones both clear and loud. We're proud to rise and cheer this man. His motto reversed the name of Kanai. When he played, it simply was I can. Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry, never bowled the ball. He hung up his bat, this local lad, and returned to sunny Trinidad. He qualified in law and was called to the bar before he left England. He became a member of the Trinidad Parliament in 1956 and was appointed Minister of Works and Transport. He built himself a house at Tunapuna near Port of Spain. Now he lived in a style that was previously the preserve of the European in the West Indies. He has always been anxious to show that a coloured man can appreciate elegance and good living, but he has no desire to forget the colour of his skin. I'm quite sure there are many values that we have in our backgrounds that we should never, never dissipate. We have a sense of humor that nobody else can match in the world. We have an attitude of tolerance that nobody else can match in the world. We have a capacity to give and take that is unequaled. I'm talking now of colored people that is unequaled in any country those things we must not give away but we can take from other countries those things which add to our enjoyment you might like some art french art as against english art you might like something spanish as against something italian or you might even prefer something from ghana than you do from lagos and from nigeria those are personal things to us. 
and we must go on liking those things. For instance, I believe that in our countries we have a larger measure of honesty than you find in any other country. Honesty, integrity. I've never told you the story. I was a little boy and I picked up an egg. I took it home and I was whipped until I went back. Put the egg down where I found it and almost whipped until I got back home again unless because I could run faster than my mother, I escaped the second whipping. That sort of thing must be retained. Constantine was knighted in the New Year's Honours List of 1962, and later that year he became the first High Commissioner for the government of Trinidad and Tobago in London, a post he held for two years. When he was appointed, he said, I have been asked to play on a sticky wicket, and at my age I would have preferred an easy one. But I am prepared to bat, because today I think the British people have learned to trust me. So, Larry, may I ask you what uh, may appear to you to be an extremely foolish question, because the answers in many ways, in many ways seem, to me at least, uh, self-evident. But nevertheless, I'm interested in, 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 in the episodes that you might tell. Have you suffered any slights in this country uh, because of your color? Oh, yes. Every colored man. And can you tell an episode that would uh, bring this out? Oh, I could tell you several. I could tell you, tell you several. I'll, I'll tell you one, a simple one. I jumped in a taxi with an English girl who had been working on a committee, and I jumped in the cab to go for lunch because we had to go back to committee meeting. And when the taxi man reached the destination in Soho, we went for lunch from Great Smith Street. I saw him looking as if some bug had bitten him. I just said to him, uh, don't look so severe, the world isn't going to end, while I was paying him my fare. And he says, don't you want me to look severe when you were traveling in a car with a, in a, a, my taxi with a white woman? So I said, what do you want me to do, walk? He says, give me my fare. So I gave him his fare without a tip. And I told him, we fought Hitler for exactly the same attitude that you display. Someday we might have to fight you, but we'll see. And I walked away. So Larry, I, I think that the field of, of race relations is, is really fraught with um, great uh, comic possibilities. Um, I think that um, and people miss the point, actually, that even Negroes living in a, a white world are more often than not watching each other. I don't know how often it happens in the sporting world, but I know as a writer that if I go into a, a writer's cocktail and there's one Negro in the room, another Negro writer, um, without knowing it, I'm beginning to watch him, I'm beginning to, to watch his gestures, I'm beginning to watch his smile. Is it real or is he, is he playing up something? Hey baby, what are you selling? Are you selling your skin or selling your talent? That sort of thing. Uh, do, you, do you find that kind of thing in cricket? But Yes, but you are interested in it, aren't you? You're bound to watch for the man who goes around trying to make himself liked by anybody or everybody and when there's a crisis he runs like the little puppy with his tail between his legs to shelter in some corner. You want to know them. Because in this fight for equality and opportunity, you need allies. And you want to be certain what type of allies you are having when you are going to ask some friend to help in this particular problem. Well, but, but when you walk into a, into a room and there's a party on and, and there's just one colored person, yes. Do you go out of your way to, to go and shake hands with him? I, mean, I, I often find that um, I'm suspicious. If, if there's another Negro, I don't, I don't particularly want to, to go and talk to him because uh, I've had bad experience. The man is probably very boring, but we have a, a community of suffering. But still, that doesn't uh, make me 
feel that I want to spend an hour chatting about race uh, at a party where I might very well be talking about Shakespeare or, or, or Faulkner. All right, but you don't need to talk about race. I always make it my business to go and meet him. Why, why particularly? Why, I, I why meet do you other people because he's it? like me. He's the only other colored man in the room. Surely there should be a small community of interest so that I perhaps am better known and I believe it's my business to go up and say hello, welcome. And then see where it goes from there. If, you, if he wants to ignore me, all well and good. I go about my business. Yes, I'm talking about um, an intolerable situation, uh, in fact, um, in which even silence uh, for a man of color uh, is a kind of, is a kind of, of self dramatization if, uh, if you keep quiet, if, um, if you're not forthcoming, everybody's saying, oh, is he feeling unhappy? Is he feeling uh, cold-shouldered? And so you find a number of people coming over to you, you know, to be nice, and, and you, you can't bear them. They're, they're boring, you don't want to talk to them. But you find yourself constantly being asked either to say something or to dramatize yourself in some kind of way. Well, I've got over that, Lewis. I don't know if that happened to me in my younger days, whether I was ever projecting myself. I don't know that I was. Some people may have thought I was, but I am happy in company. Merely to be in company gives me a certain degree of happiness. So that if somebody says that my attitude or my behavior there is a dramatization, I will accept it as that. But that is not the intention. No honor has meant more to Leary Constantine than the one given to him by Nelson in 1963. To Nelson, he was still Connie, the marvelous cricketer. Lady Constantine, the same friendly Mrs. Constantine who had lived among the Lancashire people for 20 years. Nelson showed his affection by conferring on him the freedom of the borough. Constantine has spent the greater part of his life in this country, and though he may not consider himself an Englishman, he is proud to call himself a Nelson man. Looking back on your life in this country, Sir Larry, what debt do you think you owe the English? The Englishman has given me an opportunity that would not have been given me in my own country. And I can never, never forget but in a country that started as a strange country to me, people have so opened their doors to me that I begin to wonder whether I was a West Indian or an Englishman. I know I'm not an Englishman because I do not share the coolness, the coldness, the reticence that he has acquired around the fireside. I am somebody who grew in the sun and I'm always happy, reflecting the attitude of the sun. But I would be ungrateful if I did not say that he has helped to enrich my life. He has helped to justify my right to live. And even if he has not given me everything that I've asked for my country and my countrymen, for myself, he has given me so much that life to me has been worth living. So Larry Constantine, Knight Bachelor, Black Prince from the British Empire. Cricket was his life and through the game, this grandson of a slave won great fame. Born in Jenny Dad in all humility, he rose to the ranks of high degree. Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry, who never bought a body line. Honesty and integrity are the sum total of Sir Larry. When he first encountered racial prejudice, the loaded dice of injustice, the root causes of which he was well aware, were insecurity, ignorance and fear. Neither biology or history support notions of innate supremacy. Larry, Larry Constantine, Larry. 
He never bowled a body lang By his efforts he paves the way He points this night to a new day